since my sole job here, other than looking beautiful, is to uh, make sure we're on time, we should start roughly on time. We have a great panel on a extremely important topic, that is this massive uh, bill, uh, massive law that has uh, uh, starting to have, and uh, I predict we'll have uh, profound changes on our financial system. So uh, I'll just uh, briefly tell you who's here, although you all can read. David Skeel from Penn, Jeff Miller from NYU, and Adam White, who is a lawyer. And if you go to his website, adamjwhite.com, you'll see he's also an occasional writer. Uh, he's got a piece with C. Boyd and Gray in the Weekly Standard about Dodd-Frank. Uh, called a, the big kiss or the biggest kiss the or biggest kiss the biggest lie. kiss yes That's a kiss a uh, even if it's not intentional a kiss is still a kiss so we'll hear about that uh, after we hear from uh, David and Jeff uh, David take it away great thanks a lot um, it is good to be here what I am doing I think is just kind of teeing all of this stuff up at least teeing it up from my perspective I'm going to talk about uh, the Dodd-Frank Act generally um, and do two, three, uh, three things which you could read if I were doing PowerPoints that you could see, but I can read um, even if you can't. So the first thing I want to do is uh, remind y'all of the context of Dodd-Frank, what was going on when Dodd-Frank uh, got enacted in 2010 and, and at a 40,000 foot level, what does it look like? Then second, very briefly, give a progress report uh, on Dodd-Frank. Where do we stand in the unrolling of Dodd-Frank? And then finally, I want to suggest three or four things that I think we ought to be very worried about um, with Dodd-Frank. So it's a quick Dodd-Frank um, overview, um, starting with the context. Uh, the interesting, one of the most interesting things about the context of Dodd-Frank from my perspective is the relationship between the architects of the bailouts of 2008 on the one hand and the architects, particularly from the administration side, of Dodd-Frank in 2010. Uh, so the bailouts uh, that I've, I've written most about, uh, other people have focused on other aspects of the crisis, are uh, the bailouts of Bear Stearns in early 2008, the bailout of AIG in September 2008, in between the much misunderstood bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, which was basically a bait and switch by the government, signaled that, that they would be bailed out, then did not um, bail them out. Who were the masterminds of all of this? Well, I have a, this is the, the one slide I would have wanted to show. Um, so I'll turn my laptop around since we don't have slides. Y'all probably can't see this. Um, these are the masterminds of 2000. It's a great slide. Um, this is Henry Paulson, Treasury Secretary, going like this, where like he's looking for help in the distance. Um, this is Tim Geithner, um, looking like uh, he's just got his hair done. Um, and then we have Ben Bernanke looking like he's praying. Um, uh, so the, the, the chief architects of 2008 were Bernanke at the Fed, Tim Geithner, who was then the head of the, the New York Fed, and Hank Paulson. Fast forward two years to 2010, who are the chief architects from the administration side of the proposals that led to uh, Dodd-Frank, well, the, the striking thing is it's essentially the same people, that the key players, or the key player is Tim Geithner, who's now the Treasury Secretary. Um, ben Bernanke is not formally involved uh, since he's at the Fed, but he's informally involved behind the scenes. And then the other key player is Larry Summers, um, whose instincts in many respects are uh, similar to Tim Geithner. So the first really striking thing about Dodd-Frank from my perspective is the same folks who gave us the bailouts also gave us Dodd-Frank. It's a very unusual formula. I mean, when you think about the way a bank works, um, if you make a loan, that loan runs into trouble. The person who <laughs> made the loan is not the person who decides what to do with the troubled loan. There's a good reason for that. There are all sorts of um, reasons to uh, be suspicious about um, about the, the person who made the initial loan. Um, we don't seem to operate on those principles. Same people who got us, uh, who gave us the solution uh, in 2008, were the ones who were constructing um, Dodd Frank in 2010. 
The other really striking thing about Dodd-Frank to me, um, and particularly Dodd-Frank as, it, as it worked its way through the administration, is uh, the perspective that was reflected in Dodd-Frank. I need to step back for just a second to, to put this into context. Historically in the U.S., when we've gotten major financial regulation, uh, it, among progressives in particular, there have been two stances toward that regulation. One I refer to as a Brandeisian um, stance, the Lewis Brandeis view that we need to promote competition, we need to break up monopolies, um, we don't need concentration in industry. The other perspective, and I, I'm drawing from a book of mine on um, Dodd-Frank as I say this, um, the other perspective is what I call a, the Burley perspective. After Adolf Burley, the New Deal corporate law guy, his view is concentration is okay. It's, it's okay to have giant corporations, giant banks. They just need to be managed by um, the government. You just need to keep a firm grip on them. The really, uh, the second interesting thing about Dodd-Frank, and, and probably the most striking thing about the Dodd-Frank um, Act from my perspective, is only one of those two perspectives was uh, represented. The only perspective that was represented within the administration was the Burley perspective, um, the big is okay perspective, um, which ultimately ends up being a form of corporatism, the idea that it's okay to have giant banks, okay to have um, industry dominating corporations, um, we just need them to be in partnership with, um, with government. So there was no debate within the administration, within the administration on Dodd-Frank, and, and that's reflected, I think, in what um, we got in Dodd-Frank. There are a couple of pretty big exceptions in the Dodd-Frank um, Act, which uh, a number of y'all are probably familiar with. I think Jeff is going to talk about one of them, and that's the Consumer Bureau. I think you can explain the Consumer, Consumer Bureau in corporatist terms, um, although it, it initially doesn't look like a corporatist um, set of provisions. The other big exception in Dodd-Frank is the so-called Volcker Rule. Um, the Volcker Rule is the rule that's intended to replicate Glass-Steagall. It's intended to essentially separate um, uh, commercial and investment banking. The way it does this is by forbidding banks from engaging in proprietary trading. Um, it's, it was named for Paul Volcker. Um, and this, this is definitely not a corporatist provision. It's a pretty wrong-headed provision in my view, but it's not corporatist. Um, why is that in there? That's in there. Uh, this seems like ancient history because Scott Brown won the election in Massachusetts in early 2010. The only reason the Volcker Rule is in the law is because the Obama administration got really nervous about the anti-bailout sentiment um, that was swirling in 2009 and 2010 and, and kind of came to a peak when Scott Brown won uh, what the Democrats called Teddy Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts. Um, um, so uh, Volcker rule is exception that proves the rule. So what about Dodd-Frank as a whole? The, the conventional wisdom about Dodd-Frank is, uh, is that Dodd-Frank is just this giant incoherent mess. Um, there is a fair amount of incoherence in it. There is a fair amount of mess in it, but it, it, um, it does have a straightforward set of objectives. The two main objectives as I see them are first to better regulate the instruments and institutions of contemporary finance, instruments being particularly shadow banking derivatives, things of that sort, institutions being the giant financial institutions. Second objective is putting in place what is, is advertised as a better way of resolving one of these giant institutions uh, if it fails. So relatively straightforward set of objectives, very complicated set of provisions uh, trying to deal with them. The overall effect, in my view, as I've already suggested, is to give us a very European style of corporatism, at least, um, at least as of where we are um, now. The assumption is that the big institutions will continue to dominate finance. Um, part of what Dodd-Frank does is it singles out the biggest institution for sp institutions for special treatment. Um, 
uh, overall effect, again, I think, is going to be to reinforce the kind of partnership between the big banks and Washington that we saw in 2008. Um, lots of concerns, I think, come out of this. Uh, the main ones are things like um, the likelihood innovation will be stifled in the financial services industry. I think we're already seeing that. Um, also, the likelihood that on the margin, small and medium-sized businesses are going to have trouble getting loans because um, if you concentrate everything in the giant institutions, um, the losers are the middle-sized banks. Those are the folks who make loans to small and medium-sized um, uh, businesses. So where are we on, um, on Dodd-Frank right now? As, as most of y'all probably know, Dodd-Frank, it's this huge legislation. It was 2,319 pages in the original version when you, you smushed the margins um, down for pub, final publications. It's 850, 860 pages. Um, the overall theme, or one overall theme of all that legislation, or one thing that all that legislation does, what those 900 pages of congressional print do, is outsource most of the key decision making to regulators. There are hundreds of rules called for by Dodd-Frank. That's why two and a half years after Dodd-Frank was enacted, we're nowhere near knowing what the, the overall effect of Dodd-Frank is going to be on the ground. As of January 2, a couple of days ago, ago, there had been 237 rulemaking deadlines. There's a whole bunch of deadlines in Dodd-Frank, 237 of them so far. How many of those deadlines have been met? 95 of those deadlines have been met. So 40% of the rulemaking deadlines have been met. 60% have not been met. So not only is there a huge amount of agency rulemaking to be done, it's not getting done on anything like the timeline um, Congress imagined. Um, the other uh, thing that's striking about how this is all unfolding is the tenor of the regulation is being radically shaped by what's going on in the headlines at any particular time. So um, the Volcker rule, which I referred to earlier, was proceeding along one path until the London Whale episode involving JP Morgan, uh, uh, what now looks like about a $6 billion loss. All of a sudden, it shifted gears and went in another direction. We still don't have a Volcker rule. Uh, the earliest we'll get one, by most estimations, is March, uh, is, um, is a few more um, months. Um, so finally, um, what are some things to be worried about with, um, with Dodd-Frank, where we are now, where we're likely to be uh, headed? Let me just mention very quickly four. The first is that some of the good things about Dodd-Frank may not be as good as we hope. Now, um, in some circles, to, say, to suggest that there are good things about Dodd-Frank would be seen as, as a radical uh, statement. Um, I do think there are some good things about Dodd-Frank. I think there are some areas where Dodd-Frank could make the world a little bit better. One of the, the parts of Dodd-Frank that I've defended and that others have defended is, uh, is the regulation of derivatives. Um, <coughs> the main theme of that is um, Dodd-Frank is an effort to get more derivatives clear, to get them put on clearing houses. What that means is the derivatives would essentially be guaranteed. The role of the clearinghouse is to guarantee both sides of the contract, both sides of the derivatives contract, um, in the event that one party is on, and, and to step in in the event that one party is not able to make good on the contract. Um, I, like most people, um, thought this was a step in the right direction. I still think it's a step in the right direction. But there are reasons to be worried at this point. Um, one reason to be worried is it's not at all clear, clear what percentage of derivatives will, in fact, end up getting clear, getting put on clearing houses. Um, folks were thinking it was going to be an enormous percentage, 80, 90 percent of them. Um, it's not looking like it's going to be that high, at least as of this point. Um, there are questions about the stability of the clearing houses themselves. These, these were questions that were asked from the beginning. Clearing houses are quite 
clearly um, our new too big to fail entities. Um, Dodd Frank explicitly allows the Fed to bail out clearinghouses if the clearinghouse itself fails. They have been designated as systemically important, or a number of them have. Um, so there is a danger that they're going to be the next recipient of bailouts. Um, this was not a surprise. People talked about this when Dodd Frank first went into effect. Um, the last piece with clearing houses is there now is a growing um, dissent on clearing houses in general. There now are more people arguing that even if they work the way they're supposed to work, it's not completely clear that they're going to make the world less risky. They may make the world less risky for the folks who enter into these derivatives, um, but it's not clear they'll make the world less, or they, they won't make the world less risky for everybody else um, who has a stake in, say, a bank that runs into trouble. So clearinghouses were a consensus um, uh, proposal going into Dodd-Frank. Still, I still think they're, they make things better rather than worse, but it's not, not clear if they're going to be as good as their advocates thought they would be. Second, um, and more quickly, um, there's a real, uh, I have a real concern about whether markets are going to benefit from the new disclosure requirements in Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank has a huge amount of um, of disclosure obligations written into it. A lot of information about every derivatives trade has to be disclosed. Um, one of the signature pieces of Dodd-Frank was a living will requirement that requires the biggest banks um, to tell regulators what they would do if they failed and why it's not going to cause um, systemic harm. This, these are good proposed, or these, this is a good rule in my view. But it's not clear that that information is going to get to anybody other than regulators. Um, and I think that's a real issue with Dodd-Frank, is how much is going to be disclosed in the market so that the market can make use of the information. The signs with the living wills thus far are not good. There's basically no information that matters that has been publicly disclosed. What gets publicly disclosed is just a bunch of boilerplate. Um, what that means, if that trend continues, is the regulation will only be as good as the regulators. Uh, we, won't be, uh, we won't be having more market enforcement um, of, uh, or market monitoring than we had before 2008. Third problem with Dodd-Frank is it or the way it's being handled reflects, um, in my view, in a, a continuing assault on the rule of law. Um, uh, one of the key themes in 2008, which I and others on this panel have written about, I think all of us have written about in one way or another, is uh, the way in which the rule of law was violated, was abused in 2008. Um, the signs thus far uh, are that that's not going to change at all. And, and my particular, for instance, is the FDIC, um, who was one of the big winners under Dodd-Frank. They have a lot of new authority. They have basically said that they're going to interpret their authority the way they want to interpret their authority. And an example of this is the resolution rules. Um, the, the FDIC's proposal for resolving a big financial institution that runs into trouble is what they call single point of entry. The idea is that they'll take the assets and the short-term liabilities, such as the derivatives, of the holding company um, if, if, say, Bank of America or Citigroup runs into trouble, they'll transfer that to a new a bridge financial institution. They'll then write down the long-term debt a little bit and send everything on its merry way. What is that? I think it's a clever idea. I'm not sure it will work. I think it's a clever idea, but what is it? That's what, in, in my neck of the woods, which is bankruptcy, we call a reorganization. Um, what does Dodd-Frank say about resolution? Probably most of you don't remember, uh, but Barbara Boxer got on the Senate floor right before Dodd-Frank was passed and said, let's put in a provision that says, thou shalt liquidate any institution that runs into trouble. The FDIC is just ignoring that. Um, and, um, and in this case, you know, the, the thou shalt liquidate, I think, was a stupid provision. Um, but the FDIC is, um, is ignoring a stupid provision. They're also ignoring a lot of smart provisions uh, as well. There's no um, adherence to the, 
rule of law, in my view. Finally, um, the thing that I'm most worried about in some respects um, with Dodd-Frank is, is the public relations implications of the 2012 um, election. My concern is that the moral of the election uh, in the financial world, as perceived by Washington, will be um, that everything that was done in 2008 and 2010 was a good idea, um, and that, uh, that ultimately bailouts, um, throwing money at troubled financial institutions, um, was vindicated by the American people, and we shouldn't interfere with it. Um, so I think the uh, now you really are good. Uh, I'm done. Um, so I, I mean, I think the real question is is um, is whether that story can be um, can be fended off, and I think it can be. One way it can be fended off, I hope, is by trying to fix some of the things in Dodd Frank that are fixable. And, and one of the ways to do that, in my view, is to focus more on bankruptcy for these institutions um, rather than than Dodd Frank itself. So. Thank you, David. <laughs> that was great. Uh, Jeff? Okay. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank everybody here for coming at 8.30 on a Saturday morning, especially since we're in New Orleans and there's lots of fun things to do on Friday night. Um, <laughs> also, uh, David just gave a beautiful summary of his really impressive book and more. And really <coughs> thanks. thanks very much for that. So I'm going to talk about two things. Um, <clears throat> First, <clears throat> discuss two of the agencies that are uh, created in the Dodd-Frank Act. I'm not going to deal with what Adam's going to deal with, which is the, the legal and constitutional foundations of these agencies, but more about their practicality. And second, ask if Dodd-Frank um, achieves its fundamental objective, which is to enhance financial stability in the United States. So uh, why look at the agencies? Well, uh, experience shows that you create a substantive rule of law, it can be changed. If you create an agency, it lives forever. Well, not quite forever because I guess the Office of Thrift Supervision was executed in the Dodd-Frank Act, but agencies have a way of surviving, and if their original mandate dies, they find something else to do. So the agencies that are created in Dodd-Frank Act are, are important. And the two of these uh, I'm going to discuss, the two principal agencies created by the Act, are the uh, Financial Services Oversight Council, or FSOC, and the Consumer <coughs> Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB. So the first is the Financial Services Oversight Council. What is this? Well, it's designed, it's an agency designed to identify risk and respond to emerging threats to the financial stability of our uh, economic system. What can they do? Well, they can do, they can make recommendations. Their principal power is to designate institutions as systemically important. And even if those institutions are not banks or bank holding companies, they can be subjected through this designation to substantive regulation by the Federal Reserve. And the uh, FSOC also has access to research and analysis from a new office in the uh, uh, Treasury Department, the Office of Financial Research. So it doesn't sound like a bad idea, but I'm going to suggest that as, as structured, it is a bad idea. So why? And this is based on some ideas that several people have thrown around in the Academy, including myself and Jerry Rosenfeld. Uh, we call it intellectual hazard, which is that uh, there are simply ways that uh, that complex organizations misprocess information related to risk, and that that's a big part of what caused the financial crisis in the first place. <coughs> FSOC is supposed to alleviate or mitigate that problem, but in fact, I believe that it probably exacerbates it. So why is that? Well, uh, the F <coughs> who's in first of who's in the Financial Services Oversight Council. You'd think that it might be a group of independent thinkers who bring their own perspectives from outside the government and outside the beltway and outside politics to bear on whether we have systemic risk in the financial sector. In fact, it's not that at all. It's a group of recycled regulators. They simply take the regulators from, from the major financial regulation departments and some others, put them together in a room and call them FSOC. So uh, this is not an organization that is likely to generate any independent views at all about whether there is systemic risk in the financial crisis. Instead, it's going to be a venue in which the existing regulatory agencies can advance their turf and can articulate their own preformed policy preferences. So it's absolutely not going to be the kind of thing we need, which is an independent view of uh, our financial sector. Worse yet, 
uh, although it has many uh, participants, the FSOC, as a practical matter, is going to be uh, dominated by the Secretary of the Treasury, who's the chairman of the FSOC, and the FSOC meets in the Treasury, uh, dominates the staff. So it's really under the control of Tim Geithner right now. So what we have is simply Tim Geithner uh, in another role deciding whether there's systemic risk to the financial sector, which he can already do as Secretary of the Treasury. This, I think, is a disaster. And why? Well, first of all, it leads to complacency. We now think, or people can say, we have an agency out there who's taking care, who's minding the store, who's taking care of this business we hadn't been taking care of before. But we don't. We simply have the Secretary of the Treasury wearing a different hat. What about deference? Well, you know, there's a sense that people defer to authority, and here's an authority, and people are going to defer to it. Um, loss avoidance is another sort of behavioral problem. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a committee, and everybody's going to uh, have the same uh, uh, dilution of responsibility you get in a committee. Other than Geithner, everybody's sort of going along, and they're probably just going to vote with Geithner in the sense that they're not going to be blamed if things go wrong, because after all, it was a committee. And of course, self-interest, uh, people in this organization are going to uh, advocate for their own turf and their own uh, point of view, and not uh, seriously look at uh, whether there's systemic risk to the financial system. So uh, I don't believe that FSUP delivers, and I think it can be worse than nothing in some respects, because it does lead to a certain complacency that uh, we could lead us to not actually take a serious look at this important problem. There's an object lesson here. There's an institution in Basel, and it used to be called uh, the, uh, the fin Financial Stability Forum. It's in Basel, Switzerland, and it was just like FSOC. It was composed of bank regulators, and their job was to look around the world economy and identify systemic risks to the financial system. They were there for many years before uh, 2008, and they looked around the world economy, and they utterly failed to identify the systemic risk to the financial system that was caused by the subprime mortgage securities in the United States. They completely failed to do their job, and they're just like FSOC. Now, another part of the object lesson is what happened to the Financial Stability Forum for this egregious failure? They got a big promotion, mm -hmm. and now they're Financial <laughs> Stability Bureau with much more power. Um, so I don't think FSOC uh, delivers, like I said. Uh, however, it does have some positive uh, uh, effects. It does give the ability uh, to uh, promote regulatory reform in a way that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And an, an example of this is money market mutual fund reform, which flamed out at the SEC, but now uh, FSOC, in the form of Tim Geithner, has uh, uh, made, it, I think, an interesting proposal. So that's FSOC. Now, what about the Consumer Financial Protection Board? In a way, it's a good idea also. It, con it consolidates the various consumer laws, which are all over the map and attributed responsibility attributed to different agencies. It, it centralizes them, and it, gives, uh, it creates an agency with real power to enforce uh, consumer laws. So it's not a terrible idea. There's some problems with it, other than the ones that Adam's going to mention. First is uh, it's potentially way too powerful. <coughs> it's technically... You can correct me, but it's technically in the Fed, isn't it, housed in yeah. the Fed? Well, yeah. and, and it does not have to answer to uh, Congress or OMB for its budget. So it has lots of uh, uh, discretion budgetarily, not subject to very much congressional oversight, uh, and that leads to potential abuse of power, as uh, David mentioned. Now, what is the long-term, short-term and long-term uh, 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 effect of, F of CFPB likely to be? Short-term, probably going to be bad because uh, it's a group of people, most of whom would know nothing at all about banking. They have a very large uh, examination force now who go around to banks, and they're beginning to do their on-site examinations. Only 10 to 20 percent of the people in the CFBP examination force have ever had anything to do with banks. There are about a small number of bank examiners have come over from other agencies, but most of these people are hired out of college, and they don't know what they're doing. And that's going to cause a problem, especially because they have a certain zeal for <laughs> regulation uh, that you get when you're young and just out of college. So in the short run, uh, there's probably going to be some significant cost to banks. Now, long run, I think the situation probably will be different, and banks in 15 or 20 years will probably be heard to say, we like it. Now, why are they going to say, we like it? A couple of reasons. First, built-in defense against populist attack. Right now, if the banks do something that uh, consumer groups don't like, then they excoriate and de denigrate the banks. Now, after Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is in place, they can say, hey, 
we're just doing what we're allowed to do by this agency. So talk to them, don't talk to us. So it gives them a line of defense. Over time, uh, this CFPB, like all regulatory agencies, is likely to lose its zeal to change things and actually become somewhat friendly to the banking industry. Uh, so they're going to learn to get along over time. It's also going to protect against overregulation by the states. The uh, CFPB does not have the power to preempt state regulation that goes beyond uh, what the federal law requires, but as a practical matter, I think it will, because the, the uh, political force for regulating further beyond what CFPB does is probably going to be fairly weak. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see massive uh, f state regulation of banks that goes that is more intrusive or more demanding than what uh, CFPB uh, does. So uh, it will provide over time a bulwark against overregulation by the states. And finally, it's likely to provide a defense against class actions because the CFPB, although uh, pro-consumer, shall we say, uh, is also a, regula a regulatory agency and they want to defend their turf and they actually compete with class action lawyers. So they're likely to try to uh, uh, reduce the incidence of class action litigation in banks. So my judgment on the CFPB is that over time it will be like that grain of sand that gets into the oyster and causes irritation at the beginning but ends up turning into a pearl. Okay. Hmm. Now, uh, last point. Um, the um, question uh, is fundamental question about Dodd-Frank, uh, which people haven't really asked that much, is will it do its job? Uh, and the fundamental job, although it has obviously it's a, it's a hodgepodge of many different uh, ideas from many different places, but it was enacted in the wake of a serious financial crisis and it purports to be a way of mitigating or reducing the chance that a serious financial crisis will occur in the future. So we can ask legitimately, does it do this job? Does it reduce the chance that a serious financial crisis will occur in the future? Now, I'm going to suggest that fundamentally it doesn't. So why is this? Well, it kind of my view in financial crises is that they always arise out of uh, unusual macroeconomic conditions. You get macroeconomic conditions that are not normal, that s uh, persist for a substantial period of time, say three or four years. What happens is people began, begin to expect that they will last forever. They, they bake it into their expectations, and this leads to a kind of self-perpetuating uh, cycle. This can cause either asset bubbles, uh, in, as we saw in housing uh, in, in the decade of the 2000s, and we also saw asset bubbles in equities, the stock market, and other periods, or it can lead to inflation or hyperinflation. And these are the situations that cause financial uh, crises, asset bubbles and inflation. Uh, so um, is, is uh, Dodd-Frank likely to accomplish this? If you look at the, that is, accomplish the goal of preventing that, those conditions that lead to financial crises, look around the world today. What you see is we've had a period of sustained, very low interest rates at all, uh, at all parts of the yield curve that's lasted for a number of years already. So the first part of the condition that leads to financial crisis is already there, namely a period of very unusual uh, macroeconomic conditions that's lasted for a period of time and is beginning to be baked into people's expectations. And those expectations are further uh, enhanced by what the central banks of the world are doing. Look at the Fed. The Fed has announced that it's got QE3 going. It's going to be buying bonds. It's going to be flooding the financial market in the United States and therefore the world with liquidity for a very long period of time. And in fact, it said it's going to do it until it gets in, uh, the unemployment rate down to an acceptable level. So that's going to happen. What about the Bank of Japan? New government in Japan is now pressuring the Bank of Japan, which is not actually an independent central bank, to do exactly the same thing, to flood the Japanese economy with liquidity until Japan gets out of this cycle of, uh, of deflation and low economic growth. What about Europe? The ECB is flooding the market with liquidity because they're trying to help with the bailouts of, of uh, Greece and Spain and Ireland and possibly Italy. They're trying to recapitalize uh, these uh, uh, weak uh, sovereigns. So the three major central banks of the world are all committed for a very long period of time to exceptionally loose monetary policy. Consequence, expectations of very low interest rates for a 
very long period of time. Now, when you get this, what happens? We're already seeing the effects. Industries are massively re-leveraging. Uh, re that is, they're, they're issuing uh, bonds and they're repurchasing stock to increase their leverage. And why not? Because they can borrow at almost nothing. So it's a sensible thing to do. But notice it's exactly what happened in the 2000s when uh, low interest rates caused uh, firms to do exactly the same thing. Financial institutions are taking on increased interest rate risk. That is, they're borrowing uh, low and lending long. Why? Because that's a profitable strategy to use. And the bank regulators are not seriously regulating interest rate risk at banks. Why not? Because, because it's profitable, the bank regulators want to recapitalize the banking industry the, in the United States by giving them a source of built-in profits. So they're not actually uh, preventing interest rate risk uh, seriously. And finally, another consequence of these long, low, low, low interest rates is search for yield. So the banking industry and other financial institutions are looking for ways to make a profit in investments. How do you do that when you can make a mortgage at 3.5% and, and that's what you get? It's very low profit in uh, the traditional investments for financial institutions. So again, the search for yield is likely to induce uh, banks and financial institutions uh, to go into long, uh, more risky uh, assets, especially as the trauma of 2008 fades from memory. So uh, those are problematic events. Um, something else we're likely to see. We're likely to see, as this massive flood of liquidity begins to have its effect in the economy, pu uh, pumping up of asset bubbles again. So the two asset categories we might see pump up is home, more, home, home values and equities. Well, uh, I saw that the S&P 500 is now at the highest level in five years. Uh, you, it's very possible that you're going to see a boom in equities. And house values slowly are going up. So now they're maybe 5 to 6% over last year. And this isn't yet uh, a concern. But what happens in these bubbles is that you get a curve of constantly increasing slope. And so 5% this year isn't that much, but if it goes 5% next year or 8% next year, it's more. Eventually, as this continues, the curve gets up and is, it goes towards the vertical, and that's the bubble. So uh, we're, we're not, it's not clear we're beginning that process of asset bubbles, but it's not clear we're not. And once we get into the asset bubble, it's extremely hard uh, to get out of it. So uh, this is uh, quite a concern because if we get back into that situation we've been in in the past and every financial crisis starts from, uh, well, then we could get right back into what we, uh, were in, uh, what we experienced in 2008. So Dodd-Frank does absolutely nothing about this, nothing whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, uh, to, if it does anything, it encourages the government to uh, take these policies. Now, the, if you ask someone at the Fed, they will say they're not worried about this. And they might be right, but I'm not sure. Why aren't they worried? We, we the Fed, uh, have very powerful tools of monetary policy. And if something like this starts, we're going to be able to stop it. And we've also been given the ability to pay interest on reserves, a bank reserves held at the Fed. And the Fed believes that it can uh, suppress this kind of bubble activity by paying higher interest on reserves because that's going to discourage banks from lending because they can make money at the Fed. I'm not really sure that's going to work. It has never been tested. So I guess what I'd conclude is that uh, Dodd-Frank does nothing to, uh, uh, to prevent the fundamental cause of financial crises, which is these kinds of unusual macroeconomic conditions that lead to bubbles or hyperinflation. Um, it doesn't exacerbate it too much, but does somewhat and I would say we should be cautious uh, and watch carefully because we really don't want this to happen again. Thank you, Jeff. That was super informative, if not a bit depressing. Uh, so now that we know a little bit about Dodd-Frank and some of its pathologies, maybe Adam will tell us uh, how we can get rid of it entirely. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's funny. While I'm here this weekend speaking with you, and I'm uh, grateful to be invited uh, to this event, while I'm here, uh, my boss, uh, C. Boyden Gray, is down in Florida speaking at an ABA conference of lawyers, uh, also about the lawsuit. And so I can spend the weekend learning about how our lawsuit's flawed in theory, and he's going to spend the weekend learning about how our <laughs> lawsuit's flawed in practice. Um, now, to be clear, 
Uh, the suit that I'm going to describe, which was filed earlier this year in federal court, it's not a challenge to Dodd-Frank in its entirety. It's only a, cha only a challenge to three parts of Dodd-Frank, um, which we've already discussed. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Order of Liquidation Authority, and the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, our claim against each is that it violates the Constitution's separation of powers by taking basically an un- bounded grant of power to regulators and combining that with the elimination of most or all of the, uh, of the checks and balances that would ordinarily limit the agency's exercise of that unbounded authority. Um, the claim is a little bit different for against each agency depending on the particulars of, of that agency's structure. Let me just walk through them one at a time. I'll start with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, the one that's probably gotten the most excuse me, the most public attention. Uh, the grant of power to the, to the CFPB is, is, op is, is broad, practically open-ended. Uh, among other things, they have the power to litigate against or regulate what they define to be abusive, unfair, or deceptive consumer lending practices. Uh, the term abusive isn't defined in the statute, uh, and, and the CFPB's first director, Richard Cordray, has said in congressional testimony that he doesn't think that it's, it's useful to try to define these terms in the abstract, and instead they're going to define these on a case-by-case -case basis uh, through enforcement activities or maybe regulation. Uh, so you have a pretty open-ended grant of power, uh, which in and of itself might not be the, uh, the end of the constitutional world. Other agencies have broad grants of power. But then what happens is that's combined with or, or, or um, exacerbated by the elimination of checks and balances. The president's removal authority over the CFPB director is, is limited. He basically has tenure protection. Uh, the, as, as was briefly mentioned earlier, Congress doesn't exercise any power of the purse over the CFPB. The CFPB is nominally in the Federal Reserve, although Dodd-Frank also says that the Federal Reserve doesn't have any authority over the CFPB. Uh, the Fed, uh, sorry, the CFPB gets its funding by putting in a claim on up to 12 percent of the Fed's operating budget, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Um, and in fact, uh, Dodd-Frank specifically prohibits the congressional committees from reviewing that part of the CFPB's budget. Um, and so the, the famous power of the purse, Madison's greatest um, uh, congressional tool, uh, doesn't apply to the CFPB. And finally, judicial oversight of the CFPB is limited. There's a provision in, uh, in Title X, the CFPB section of Dodd-Frank, that uh, effectively requires the courts to give Chevron deference to the CFPB's interpretation of not just these new provisions of law, but also the 18 uh, statutory frameworks, pre-existing statutory frameworks that were once administered by other agencies and are now administered exclusively or primarily by the CFPB. So again, with the CFPB, it's an open-ended grant of power, limited presidential oversight, limited congressional oversight, and even uh, limited, ju limited judicial oversight. Now, the orderly liquidation authority, or as we, uh, as we like to call it on the legal team, death, uh, death panels for corporations, uh, it is, uh, it's, suffers from many of the same problems, but it's a little bit different. Uh, this is the provision that allows the Treasury Secretary to come in, declare a financial company to be in uh, financial distress, uh, either default or danger of default, uh, and, and that it poses uh, threat to the systemic financial stability of the United States. He comes in, he can take the company and, and liquidate it, which means, as, as was mentioned earlier, either uh, get rid of the company or more likely uh, have it restructured. The way it works is the Treasury Secretary declares, uh, back up, upon the recommendation of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Secretary declares that he makes a determination that the company needs to be liquidated. If the company uh, doesn't want to go along with this, they, uh, the Treasury Secretary goes to federal district court where the court has 24 hours upon the filing of the suit to review the decision and, uh, and decide whether or not to allow the liquidation to go forward. That's literally 24 hours. Uh, the district court can't stay the liquidation. It, can't, it has to come up with a final decision on the merits in 24 hours. If it doesn't, the Treasury Secretary wins by default and we proceed into liquidation by the FDIC. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you in, the, in, in this room have litigated in federal district court and you know full well you're not going to get a briefing schedule out of the district court in 24 hours, let alone a final decision on the merits. Once the, uh, once you, the Treasury Secretary clears that bar in district court, uh, 
it moves over to the FDIC, which has open-end authority to basically pick and choose which creditors it will prefer over others. There's a provision in there that specifically says that similarly situated creditors need not be treated equally. Uh, the FDIC has basically unbounded discretion to pick winners and losers. And we've seen how that played out. We saw that played out in 2008 with Chrysler. Uh, in GM, where some stakeholders were made whole, others, including the state of Indiana's pension funds, uh, had to eat a cram down to the tune of millions of dollars. Uh, so that's how liquidation basically, and, and l l along the way, let me say that in addition to that first round of judicial review of the Treasury Secretary's determination being limited, uh, judicial review of the FDIC's um, actions carrying out the liquidation are strongly limited. Uh, so basically what we have is, again, an open-ended open grant of power to regulators because the terms that they apply in determining whether to liquidate a company and how to liquidate it are, are broad, almost to the point of being open-ended. Uh, here the problem is not so much, in terms of checks and balances, not so much presidential oversight. I mean, the Treasury Secretary does serve at the pleasure of the President, the FDIC less so. Um, but here the major problems are the elimination of, again, the power of the purse. This isn't funded by Congress. Second, the, I think I said earlier, the draconian limits on judicial review. Um, uh, and so that's, the, the, those are the, the, the loss of checks and balances there. The third part we're challenging, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Here the problems are again, the, it's basically an open-ended grant of power. I mean, the, the standards that the FSOC applies in determining whether or not a non-bank financial company is a SIFI are uh, they're not exhaustive. I think there are seven enumerated factors, and then the eight is, or whatever else seems to make sense to you guys or seems important. Um, judicial review of the FSOC's determinations are, are limited. Uh, it has just arbitrary and capriciousness review. Um, there's no uh, provision for reviewing the, just the straightforward uh, legality of the FSOC's decisions, say the APA standard of whether or not it's contrary to law. Um, members of the FSOC are appointed I, I think this is right. I, not, there are non-voting members of the FSOC that are appointed not by the president, not even by the Treasury Secretary, but through a process to be determined by state banking, insu banking and insurance commissioners. Um, they're non-voting members, but they're fully participating members. And so here with the FSOC, the problem is an open-ended grant of power combined with limited judicial review um, and uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, right, and the, the limit on the, on the president's appointment of non-voting members. And let me say, interestingly enough, judicial review of, of um, no, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so that's, 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 the, that's our main claims. We have other claims in the case. We're challenging the recess appointment of the CFPB's first director. We have a due process challenge against the order liquidation authority. And we also, um, perhaps <coughs> our most novel claim will be an uh, argument that orderly liquidation violates the Constitution's requirement of uniform bankruptcy laws. <coughs> so that, now that's the case. Having sketched out uh, the separation of powers, uh, the, 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 the novel structure of these agencies, you're probably asking, well, so what? Uh, we know how independent agency litigation has worked. Uh, independent, you know, independent agency cases are, have, have been about limits on presidential oversight of agencies. Um, congressional encroachment upon uh, the president's prerogatives. Uh, how's your case going to work under the law? Well, I would point you to the case, uh, the Peekaboo case, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, the Sarbanes-Oxley Board, uh, whose constitution, whose structure was scrutinized by the Supreme Court a couple of years ago. In that case, uh, the question was, could Congress and the president put an independent agency within an independent agency? Uh, the, this, this Public Company Accounting Oversight Board within the SEC, which we'll assume is independent for the purposes of that case. Uh, can you do that? And, and the, the, the Peekaboo's uh, proponents said, well, listen, an independent agency is constitutional, so an independent agency within an independent agency is constitutional. It's just one constitutional body within another. And the Supreme Court said no. Um, th their exact words actually were, We've previously upheld limited restrictions on the president's removal power, but the added layer of tenure protection makes a difference. This novel structure does not merely add to the board's independence, but transforms it. Basically, the court said that Humphrey's executor, Morrison v. Olson, marked the outer limits of agency independence with respect to removal power, and that as a matter, as a matter of first principles, the court would not allow the doctrine to creep any further. That case, I, I'd like to think of that case as sort of vertical stacking of, independent, of independence, one independent agency within another. Our case looks at this in a different direction. It's horizontal 
um, stacking of independents, so to speak. It's not just the limitation on the president's removal power of the CFP of the one of the agency's director, but it's also the elimination of uh, or restriction of congressional oversight, uh, judicial oversight, and uh, again the, the sort of related question of open-ended grant of power to the agency to begin with. Now. Why does that make a difference? Well, if you look at the old cases on agency independence and the non-delegation cases, they all operate under the same common set of backgrounds, namely that we can allow this broad grant of power, or we can allow this one, limit, this one limitation on presidential oversight because there are all these other auxiliary protections. For example, Morrison v. Olson, the independent counsel case. The Supreme Court said, yeah, sure, uh, it's okay to limit the president's removal of the independent counsel because after all, uh, among other things, the independent counsel has limited jurisdiction. He lacks policy making or significant administrative authority. Well, obviously, that's not the case here. Uh, these agencies have broad administrative and policy making authority. Humphrey's executor, the, uh, the background assumption was, w and the stated, the stated pr premise of the case was well, sure, these are limited from presidential oversight, but they are quasi legislative, quasi judicial bodies, and therefore they're acting as agents of Congress or agents of the courts. Here, that's not the case. Uh, they're insulated against the oversight by Congress and, to a lesser extent, the courts. Um, in, uh, in, 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 in Whitman versus American Trucking, the non-delegation case, the court said, well, yeah, the EPA has a broad grant of power, uh, one that incidentally was limited by the, the President and Solicitor General's interpretation of the Clean Air Act in that case. Uh, but also, the court recognized, uh, Justice Scalia's opinion stated, that the degree of acceptable agency discretion varies with the scope of the power of that agency. And so the EPA, which was going to be subject to, judici to judicial review under the Administrative Procedure Act, which was administering just a narrow section of the Clean Air Act, the court said it's okay for them to have broad discretion here because the power is ultimately limited. And there have been other scholars, Kenneth Culp Davis and others, who have pointed out that the non-delegation doctrine was basically shaped by the background uh, premise uh, or the, the background assumption that at the very least we'll have judicial review. Um, uh, judicial review to oversee the agency's work, and most of these, uh, the, you know, the EPA again is operating under under the control of the president. I guess what I'm saying is, these doctrines uh, they don't exist; they never existed in the abstract. They've all hung together one with another, each operating in the background of one another's cases: the non-delegation cases, the presidential removal cases, and so on. Uh, I guess another example, in the 1970s, the Railroad Reorganization Act, where you had very broad powers given to the government to reshape the, um, the, the nature of the American railroad industry. The court said, well, at the very least, we know this is constitutional because there remains the Tucker Act. And so if things get out of hand, uh, aggrieved parties can still at least go to court and uh, get their claims for compensation, which again, in the case of oil liquidation, uh, is, is at best true in theory. It's certainly not going to be true in practice, as a number of scholars have pointed out. Uh, our case tests the limits of these, uh, of these, or our case exists beyond the limits of those doctrines. Our case is one where the background presumptions of these auxiliary protections falls out. And it's a worst case scenario. What happens when you combine broad grants of power with the elimination of numerous uh, checks and balances? Now, there's been on the question of this next, this next generation of independent agencies, there's already been some good work done, especially by Rachel Barco, um, Jacob Gerson, and others who have talked about uh, agencies, not just in terms of independence, the term of art meaning presidential oversight of these, uh, of these agencies, but what they call insulation. You know, Rachel specifically identified funding controls um, and, and, and judicial oversight as, as, as other forms of control over agencies that uh, in new statutes Congress and others might want to pare back, whether to preserve the agency's expertise, to avoid agency capture, whatever. Rachel and others have pointed out that these are important considerations. Well, what people haven't looked at yet in our case will test is those might be true in terms of th th those premises, those arguments might be sound as a matter of political science, but what about constitutional structure? What happens with this next generation of, of insulated independent agencies? How far can we go beyond the contours of the old cases before, as in the case of the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, a change in quantity basically becomes a change in constitutional uh, quality. Now let me tell you about the case specifically. It was filed in June. Uh, originally it was just a challenge to the CFPB and the FSOC. It was brought first and foremost by a West Texas community bank, the State National Bank of 
of Big Spring and a couple of, uh, let's be candid, conservative uh, nonprofit groups. Uh, the case was amended a couple of months ago. Uh, we added our claims against the Orderly Liquidation Authority, and those claims are being brought by three states, Oklahoma, uh, South Carolina, and Michigan. Uh, here's, here's why the, each group is bringing each claim. Obviously, the West Texas Community Bank is regulated by the CFPB, or they're affected by the CFPB's regulations. They've already been driven out of the mortgage market by the uncertainty of this. They're, the, the CFPB's regulations on so-called remittance transfers, wire transfers, have already affected uh, the bank's business. And so it's been, it's been aggrieved by the <coughs> CFPB. It's bringing these claims. With respect to the Financial Stability Oversight Council, those claims are also being brought primarily by the, uh, the community bank. And this is, this is where that article, The Biggest Kiss, uh, comes from. Because in some respects, I think this argument was a bit counterintuitive at first, starting to gain, gain traction. At first, the FSOC was seen as a burden on big banks. Uh, the so-called SIFIs, the systemically important financial institutions, were going to be subject to heightened oversight. That's true, but with those burdens came great benefit. Because before Dodd-Frank, uh, banks that were seen as systemically important uh, enjoyed a great cost of capital advantage uh, in the markets. They were seen as less risky. Uh, Dodd-Frank exacerbates that effect in a couple of ways. First, it increased the, uh, well, it increased the universe of, of possible SIFIs in a few ways. First, it lowered basically the threshold for SIFI status. It used to be seen as, as $100 billion in assets. Uh, by statute, that's now down to $50 billion. So you're going to see smaller financial institutions qualifying for SIFI status. It extends it from not just the big banks to so-called non-bank financial institutions. Uh, and it takes SIFI status from something that was sort of implicit, uh, sort of guessed at, and it's now going to make it official. Each of those is going to exacerbate the cost of capital advantage that the big banks enjoy uh, to the detriment of small banks like the State National Bank of Big Spring. And that's where the line, the biggest kiss, comes from. In the first uh, presidential debate, Mitt Romney said that Dodd-Frank was the biggest kiss that Wall, Wall Street had ever received from Washington. And there was a little bit of chortling among pundits when he said that. You know, everybody knows that Dodd-Frank beats up on the big banks. Well, no, not really. Uh, Adolph Burrow uh, would know that, and Louis Brandeis would know that. And uh, the State National Bank of Big Spring knows that. The states, in their claim against orderly liquidation authority, here's where that comes from. Their each, each of our states holds uh, the debt of big banks. They have held it uh, for a long time in their pension funds. Uh, under Dodd-Frank's, uh, under the provision of, of Title II that allows the FDIC to pick and choose among winners and losers and creditors uh, um, upon a liquidation, uh, it on its face eliminates the ordinary rights of, uh, of the states as creditors. This is the rule of law issue that David is alluding to. Uh, when these states bought these bonds, they, were, they bought them under uh, the pre-existing bankruptcy laws and other federal laws governing the debt and also the, the terms of the debt. Well, that all goes out the window. There's now an asterisk on all those documents that says these rights exist except when an orderly liquidation happens, in which case it all goes out the window. Like I said, some states learned that the hard way in Chrysler when Indiana um, swallowed millions of dollars in pension fund losses. And uh, this time the states are getting out ahead of that risk. In fact, it's interesting, the way the judicial review works with uh, orderly liquidation uh, the states can't bring these claims once a liquidation happens. Judicial review, both of the Treasury Secretary's determination that a company is going to be liquidated, and then the FDIC, judicial review of the FDIC's liquidation decisions, um, uh, it precludes the raising of these constitutional claims at any stage in litigation. So when the government filed its motion to dismiss uh, in November, and we're responding at the end of this month, and said, no, 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 uh, you're not injured yet. Wait until there's a liquidation before you bring these claims. Well, our answer is going to be, well, I'm sorry. At that point, it's too late, and you know that. Um, uh, and, and so, our, again, we filed the case in June. I amended it in September. The government filed their motion to dismiss in November. We'll file our response at the end of January. And, uh, and I, I know I've gone long, but let me just, I breezed past this. Uh, the academic literature on independent agencies is from another era. It's from the New Deal era and, and thereafter, where the question was Congress's encroachment upon the powers of the president. Now, that wasn't the only paradigm for evaluating independent agencies. I mean, before the New Deal, the question was, to what extent do independent agencies infringe upon the power of the courts? Now, Tom Merrill's done great work looking at the, 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 the questions that were raised by the ICC's sort of Encroaching, uh, encroaching on the turf of the courts and the extent to which judicial review should, should, should preserve the ICC's independence or restore the district court's work. Uh, 
Um, the paradigm of, of Congress taking, away from the, taking power away from the president, it really does not suit well this next generation of independent agencies. Uh, for me, the line, I think the best, what best captures what's happening now it doesn't come from the independent agency literature. It comes from John Hart Ely's book, War and Responsibility. At the very beginning of the book, um, talking about the law, Congress's abdication of power to the, to the president, John Hart Ely wrote, it's common to style this shift as a usurpation, but that oversimplifies the point, oversimplifies to the point of misstatement. Congress and the courts ceded the ground without a fight. In fact, and this is, the message, this is much of the message of this book, the legislative surrender was self-interested. Accountability is pretty frightening stuff. That's basically what's happening now with the independent agencies. It's not Congress taking away the president's power. It's Congress taking away the president's power and their own power. It's a question of accountability. And I hope that the, the, the next sort of generation of legal scholarship focuses on, uh, on, this, on this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, please uh, uh, join me in thanking our uh, panelists for their uh, informative remarks. Uh, now it's time to hear from uh, all of you. I will uh, ask you to come up and step up to the microphone so that we can, we can hear you. I will take the moderator's prerogative and get the ball rolling by asking a, a question or, or five at the beginning. Um, so help me understand, I, I don't think I've ever understood the bit too big to fail idea. Um, you talked, David, about the sort of Brandeisian view of small being a good thing, sort of a Roosevelt idea to Teddy, not uh, his uh, cousin. Um, but why is unnaturally small better than unnaturally big, right? There's obviously advantages for economies of scale and scope, and if you are really good at something, obviously you can be bigger at it. So the only thing I can think of is um, some kind of a political economy story. Uh, but the political economy story uh, doesn't fit exactly with the savings and loan crisis because there, there were no really big financial institutions. They were little financial institutions that were politically quite influential. Um, and it always has seemed to me that what really matters is correlated risk in the financial system, not bank, you know, risk at bank A, bank B, bank C. So if, you know, if your idea is small, but the same amount of correlated risk is held by 50 financial institutions as opposed to four financial institutions. I'm not sure I know exactly why that's different. Uh, again, using the savings and loans as an ex example. So how do you kind of come out in this brandeis burley dichotomy that you set up? And, and it sounded like you were a Brandeisian, and I wanted you to def defend that. Uh, these are great questions. I'm not sure if... Um, if I have an intelligent answer um, uh, to to a couple pieces uh, of the questions on the on the correlated risk versus concentrated risk, this is the argument that the big banks are making now: is that it would um, it'd be a mistake to break us up because if you break uh, Citigroup or Bank of America. Up, um, what you're going to end up with is 10 banks who have the same risk profile overall um, as one bank. You know, I guess my answer to that is I don't believe it. I mean, I, I just don't believe that the 10 banks will end up having the same um, risk profile. And what I, I really worry, I really worry about the incentive, and I'm going to say the same thing in a different way, the incentive for the government to intervene on their behalf. I just think it's bigger when, um, when you're dealing with one bank than with your, if you're dealing with, with 10. I'm also more comfortable with industry-wide intervention. Um, than I am with picking your places to intervene. And, and uh, for instance, on that, and, and not everybody would agree with me on this, during 2008, I thought the bailout of Bear, I thought the big mistake was the bailout of Bear Stearns early in, in 2008, picking a bank, protecting it, um, paying everybody off um, uh, in full. Um, I was less hostile to TARP the $700 billion um, bailout the entire banking industry legislation. I'm more comfortable with it. I mean, if, you're ba if your banking industry is about to crash, I think you do have to pump liquidity into it. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm saying the same thing in a lot of different ways. I guess I don't really believe the one big bank equals 10 
little banks. And I think that's, that's a big part of the argument. And if I'm right about that, then you have a different kind of government involvement in the financial services industry. If, if you've got one big bank, you've got a partnership between the government and the bank. If you've got 10 smaller banks, you don't have that same partnership. But it all, it all hinges on that question whether one bank equals 10 banks or not, I think is what I would say. Don't be shy. Yes, please. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> So uh, my question is primarily for Professor Miller and, and also for Professor Skeel. Um, I, I may have misunderstood or misheard, but I thought that, uh, Professor Miller, you were suggesting that we understand the causes of financial crises, and the causes of financial crises are high inflation and asset bubbles. And you sounded to be very confident that those were the only two causes of financial crises. And I heard kind of a similar sentiment from Professor Skeel. I thought so. I thought you were saying. Um, that uh, some actions by uh, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury as of 2008 had led to the subprime crisis. That they had done something that created that crisis. Um, not just bail it out, but they actually caused it. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering uh, what is the source of the confidence in this view um, and what do you think about some of the very long-term international studies of financial crises by economists like This Time is Different by Rein Reinhard and Rogart and Ruel Rubini's study, which don't seem to suggest that those are the only two causes of financial crises or even necessarily the most important ones and seem to actually suggest that the causes are poor lending decisions, right? bad, bad credit standards. So I was just wondering what, what your thoughts are on Can that. I start, Jeff, because I, because I don't have an answer. So I, <laughs> Jeff is going to ask. So I wasn't intending to say anything about the cause. I was, I was intending to talk more about the response, although you correctly intuited my feelings about the cause. I mean, I do think Fed policy was a major contributing factor to the crisis. But I wanted to ask Jeff, um, I think, the same question you asked, which is, um, what, or, or a version of, or part of what you asked, which is, you know, what is a good response to these problems? First of all, what are the real problems? And then the second of all, um, if we can identify what the likely causes of a future bubble are, what should we be doing rather than dot frag? So I just glommed onto your question. <laughs> well, um, my answer is <clears throat> you just look at the financial crises that have occurred around the world in the past 100 years. And virtually, I think probably every single one of them has had as a precursor these conditions of macro, long-term macroeconomic conditions that are unusual. And those typically take the form of an asset bubble or hyperinflation. So for example, the US depression and the worldwide depression of the 1930s, that was the result of an asset bubble, two asset bubbles actually, real estate and equities. Japan had a crisis uh, after its asset bubble in uh, the, the 1970s where Japan's stock market went to ridiculous heights. The savings and loan crisis that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Todd mentioned, the result of an asset bubble in real estate in the South and also the result of uh, unusual high interest rates that were themselves the result of uh, uh, inflation in the United States economy. You look at any single financial crisis, and I would predict that you will find behind it exactly one of these phenomena, namely sustained unusual macroeconomic conditions. Now, are there other causes? Of course there are, because nothing that big is caused by only one uh, phenomenon, but I think that's the principal cause. You mentioned uh, bad lending decisions. Well, where does bad lending decisions come from? You know, lenders are always around there. They're always able to make bad lending decisions. So why do they suddenly start to make bad lending decisions? I think the reason they suddenly start to make bad lending decisions is because you're in an asset bubble and because you have massive amounts of credit on hand. When there's massive amounts of credit on hand, people make bad lending decisions. In the Japanese bubble economy, uh, there was a, a, a gentleman who said, well, all I have to do is take, he was known as the bubble gentleman. <laughs> he, was a, he was an entrepreneur. He said, I just have to get a bucket, and I take it over to the tap, and I turn on the tap, and then I take it and I throw it out. Because the banks were so desperate to lend him money because they had so much money on hand. So, well, I, I, I certainly think there are other causes, but I would truly believe that they all go back to one of these macroeconomic conditions. 
Um, so that's kind of my answer. You know, other people could disagree, but having studied it, that's my conclusion. And I guess the the proper response is don't create asset bubbles, or is it? Well, you know, this is something we, we wonder about. What do you do? How do you prevent this from happening? And I'm much less optimistic about that. Because when, you know, when an asset bubble starts, uh, it often starts due to factors not having to do with anybody's decision. It's econo <coughs> economic conditions. How did the, you know, how did the housing bubble start? There were changes. The Community Reinvestment Act might have had something to do with it. Uh, uh, low interest rates had something to do with it. But at the beginning, it's caused by fundamental economic conditions. But after a while, these things take hold. Once they've taken hold, once it becomes self-referential in the sense that people are buying and selling in their expectation of what other people will do instead of what the fundamental values are, it's extremely hard to stamp it out. Because it's like, not that I've ever experienced this, but it's like cocaine. Because uh, it feels so good. When you're in an asset bubble, everybody feels good. And who's going to stop the asset bubble? Uh, we all knew we were in a housing bubble in the 2000s, but no one stopped it. And the reason no one stopped it is it felt so good. No one wanted to take the responsibility for killing that particular goose that was laying these golden eggs. So uh, I, you know, our problem is that before the asset bubble truly takes hold and we recognize it as a bubble, we don't know whether it's a bubble, and it's very risky to stop something that could be due to economic fundamentals. Once it's taken hold, it's a bubble, and it's very hard to stop it because it feels so good. So there's really no point in this curve where there's an optimal time to intervene. And that's a, a problem of, of public policy that, like uh, David, I don't have an answer to. Can I ask a follow-up, or is that? Okay. Please. Quickly. Please yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on why the recent asset bubble developed specifically in housing when many people have said there are other areas where there was a lot of underinvestment, for example, in infrastructure? The you know, American Society of Civil Engineers has come out and said the U.S. is $3 trillion behind on infrastructure. So why, when there seems to be all of this low-hanging fruit or sort of obvious investments to make, do we have this massive misallocation of capital? into um, subprime mortgages when you know people kind of probably should have known that <coughs> people were being lent this money, we're not going to be able to pay it back. And is there anything to the story that this was because of structured finance, because of financial innovation, because the markets were broken by these new complex instruments? Yes, I think there's something to that. Uh, however, when you look at asset bubbles through history, they occur in two areas. One is housing and one is equities. Uh, so the fact we had a housing bubble is not surprising. If you flood the market with liquidity, as the Fed was doing in the 2000s, it's like it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, and eventually you're going to have a flood. Uh, the question is where the water goes, and this time it went to housing largely. Uh, there was a bit of a commodities bubble as well. I don't think infrastructure has typically been the recipient of the excess liquidity that goes into the economy during one of these bubble periods. Why not? Interesting question. But I think it's largely because the infrastructure decisions are made by governments, and they're not made by individuals so much. Uh, and it seems to be the, the individual uh, psychology that really pumps these bubbles up. So, but that's a very interesting question that people have thought about. Why, when we have excess liquidity, does it tend to go to particular categories of investments and not others? Can I, I should just note also, uh, you know, the idea that structured finance, I mean, it obviously was a factor, but there was structured finance for a long time and during the crisis in tons of other areas that had didn't see the same effects, to, to Jeff's point. Uh, credit card, accounts receivables, corporate loans, takeover. I mean, there was just countless areas where the same exact tools were being used and we didn't see and haven't seen. Uh, the same uh, outcomes as we saw in housing. Just, just to jump in and add a couple points, I mean, when Jeff just said, this time it went to housing bubble, I think it's important this time, and let's keep in mind what had just happened before the housing bubble was we had experienced uh, the problems in equities, you know, Enron, Arthur Anderson, the internet bubble. I mean, I don't think it was irrational for people to say, well, having gone through that, well, I'll just put some money in my house. I mean, I can't live in my 401k, but at least I can live in my house. Um, I would say, though, on infrastructure, it's an issue I follow um, for uh, other areas of my practice. I'm familiar with the, 
uh, ASCE report, I, I always sort of chuckle. I mean, asking civil engineers whether we need more infrastructure is kind of like <laughs> asking your barber if you need a haircut. Um, but in fact, there was there was at least some investment in infrastructure, right? I mean, whether it was selling, it was leasing off the Chicago Skyway or the Chicago was it, parking meters, um, the nascent efforts at public-private partnerships. Um, down in the ports, down in Texas and elsewhere. I mean, there was sort of openness to redirecting some of this capital into infrastructure, but as, as Jeff mentioned, I mean, that, or since it's driven by largely government ownership, I mean, it raises raise its own host of problems, um, but maybe it'll be the next bubble. Okay, Naomi. Hi, um, Naomi Rao, I'm at George Mason. Um, so I had a question for you, Adam. I'm interested, very interested in the lawsuit that you all have brought, and obviously there are lots of constitutional problems with the, the CFPB and the FSOC. Um, but one of the things I was wondering is it seems that um, the way that your lawsuit is thinking about the separation of problems is a kind of functional one. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that this independence is too much, right. right? And so you're asking the court to invalidate these, you know, these parts of Dodd-Frank, right? Because they've kind of gone too far. And um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, both as a theoretical matter and as a practical matter, if you think um, that will work, right? So it seems like in, in many of the court's decisions where they do enforce separation of powers, they take a much more formal view, mm -hmm. right? They find something, you know, like in Chada, mm -hmm. by Caramelism and Resentment, or, you know, even in the Peekaboo case, right, the president's removal power, like something, you know, specific, right, right. that they can use. And... Um, and so if that's the case, like, I wonder if the remedy just goes too far. And also, um, you know, I've been working on a paper about this, but it seems to me that just fixing the removal power problem addresses most of the constitutional infirmities. And so I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts. No, definitely. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked the question because I know you've been working on this, and I was going to actually pester you afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, for cal I know you have a paper out there, so now I've pestered you. But please send a copy. Um, a couple of things. First, you're right. Uh, the case doesn't lend itself to the sort of easy line drawing that some, let's say, the Peekaboo case does, and that is uh, quite a, an operational hazard in any kind of, of, of litigation. Um, and so we're aware of that. I would push back a little bit. Um, the, the court has taken. It's taken a. Let me say, it's. It often has fra it's worded its opinions formalistically, but I think their analysis has been pretty functional. Right? I mean, this was clearest in Morrison v. Olson, where they, they specifically rejected the sort of formalistic, quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial versus executive mindset, and it actually became just an inquiry of how much encroachment on the president is too much. Well, no, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, uh, fair enough. Uh, but uh, even with the Peekaboo case, I mean, it's true it was formal line drawing, but it was as a practical matter. I mean, they said uh, how much is, is, is too much, right? And, and we're going to allow the sort of one layer of independence to stand but go no further. I mean, that incorporates both sort of formalistic line drawing but also sort of practical consideration of, of what's, you know, what, what's the logical end point if we allow one independent agency within another, within another, within another is a line in the case of the court says, you know, the government wouldn't even concede sort of seven layers of independence would be too much. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, our basic point is that, and uh, let me fudge a little bit, and we're, since we're at the motion to dismiss stage, I don't want to get out too far ahead of my <laughs> co-counsel <laughs> on the merits of the case. Um, the bullet, the sort of the, the bumper sticker line I like to walk around with is, if you're going to hand regulators a blank check, you ought, to, you ought to at least require two signatures before they cash it. And basically, I guess the point is, is, is leaving in place all the existing case law, especially with respect to independent oversight, you, you can't go further than that. And so therefore, if we're going to allow, say, with the CFPB, the CFPB director to be insulated against presidential oversight, well then to layer on top of that the power of the purse restrictions and the restrictions on judicial review, that simply goes too far. And so if the court wants to leave, say, Morrison, Humphreys, etc., and everything else intact, which I think they should, then it just becomes a question of taking away those auxiliary protections. Um, that's probably the closest uh, thing we have to a bright line, at least that I can, I can, I can volunteer ahead of my co-counsel. Uh, yeah. And and again, since it's Boyd and Gray and Associates, and I'm very much the associate, uh, I, uh, I I remain subject to Boyd's removal authority. <laughs> <laughs> Please build. 
I want to start off by confessing two things. One is that I'm a rube. I know nothing about this area of law. I'm just an ordinary investor and consumer of banking services. And the second is that most of my background is as a federal prosecutor, so I tend to see things through a prism that may be different uh, from the prism that you see things. Given that, let me ask three short questions. The first is, what is going on with Bernanke? Um, you know, when I was growing up, the head of the Fed was <coughs> said to be a person who was worried about inflation. Uh, now we have QE1, QE2, and QE infinity, uh, which seem to me to be operating simply by encouraging inflation, by doing nothing but inflation. This business about buying bonds actually just means printing money. It's true that because of the present slack in the economy, the inflation we're building up is not currently all that visible, but it will be. Uh, and it just seems to me Bernanke, who was appointed by President Bush, is just building up trouble for the future. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be much recognition in him that the problem we have in this country is not principally a liquidity problem, it is principally a solvency problem. Uh, and until there is that recognition, we're going to continue to be in trouble one way or the other. The, the second thing goes to something that you said, uh, Professor Steele, uh, that uh, Dodd-Frank tends to discourage banking innovation. Uh, in my view, one of the few good things that Dodd, that's one of the few good things that Dodd-Frank does because my experience is that what is called innovation is simply uh, a more cleverly concealed shake and jive uh, of irresponsible lending, and I don't want any more innovation. I've had enough. Uh, uh, I would prefer a return to what banks uh, were portrayed as in Frank Capra movies, which is uh, repositories of prudence and judgment, not innovation. And my third question is, uh, wasn't the financial crisis not caused so much by simply, you know, blandly named macroeconomic factors? Wasn't it, in fact, uh, simply a slightly concealed fraud on a grand scale? Things started off, uh, as the Professor Miller was saying, by, by borrowing, which has become an addiction in this country. Addictions do feel good, and they're very hard to break. Uh, it became so addictive that what actually happened is that uh, Wall Street became more and more addicted to what were known at the time as liar loans. The problem that we had uh, with housing and with banking is that people who couldn't afford housing were unable to buy houses anyway. The reason they were unable to buy houses is that they could take out mortgages by rampant lying about their assets, interests, uh, you know, uh, assets and debt and their income. Uh, people knew they were lying, as I say, the, the lines the, the mortgages were called liar loans at the time, but they were accepted anyway because there was money to be made on them, and more broadly because lying is increasingly accepted not just in the banking industry but in the country as a whole. And isn't the answer to this uh, not just to move around the deck chairs, be it Dodd-Frank or anything else, but a cultural change that no longer tolerates deceit to anything like the extent we tolerate it now? Can I take a first one? Please. <laughs> so on, in, <clears throat> on inflation and Bernanke, he, he, his background, as you say, he's, he's an economist who actually studied the Great Depression, so it's kind of ironic that uh, he should become head of the Fed at the time when we had the second biggest financial crisis in recent history. Um, but his position on that on, uh, was that we, we should have dealt with the Great Depression by greatly increasing the supply of credit. Uh, in fact, he's known as Helicopter Ben in some areas because he had this metaphor that you should fly over the country in a helicopter and drop dollar bills down, and that would uh, revitalize the economy. So I think what he's doing is more or less consistent with the positions he's taken as an academic. But on the point about inflation, today uh, the banking industry in the United States has more than $1 trillion of unused lending capacity uh, because they're not lending and they're getting huge amounts of the liquidity the government is creating uh, in, in banks. 
they have so much that some banks have stopped accepting deposits. They don't want deposits. They don't even give you, not only will they pay you nothing for deposits, they don't want your deposits because they have nothing to do with it. So there's a massive amount of potential energy for inflation built into the banking system. Now, it hasn't come out yet, but it's there as a potential, and it's going to get more as the Fed continues this process of quantitative easing. Um, will this cause inflation? Uh, that the jury is out. The Fed believes that if banks start to lend more and the economy starts to heat up and price levels start to go up, uh, the Fed can control this because it now has the power to pay interest on reserves. And if it wants to drain money out of the banking system, it can either do this through open market operations or it can raise the interest it pays on reserves and banks, instead of lending, are going to leave their money at the Fed to make the money the Fed can, uh, they, they'd earn from the Fed. Now, I don't think this necessarily is going to work. I'm not a macroeconomist, but I just am not sure it's going to work because for the Fed to do this, it's going to have to actually raise interest rates to pay more to the, to the banks on their reserves, and that itself is inflationary. So uh, I think, you know, that the, we have to wait and see. The Fed's very confident they can control this but they were confident they control things in the 2000s and they didn't. So I kind of agree with you, but I think we still have to wait and see whether that plays out. So I'll take the second question and then we can fight over, I don't know, Adam, if that means you take the third or we can fight over it. So the second question was, do we really want more uh, innovation? Don't we want less? I, there's a part of me that's tempted to say touche um, and agree with you. Um, but I can't agree with you um, uh, altogether. Uh, and so what I'll say is um, a lot of the innovation that we got, in my view, was, was good innovation. And I'll lean on something Todd said earlier, that the, the problems were in particular sectors. The problems were not, for the most part, with the financial engineering. Now, um, that said, I think there are some innovations that are a little bit hard to defend. Uh, CDO cubed and things like that. It, it's really hard to find what the um, what the social benefit there um, is. But with a lot of the the innovation, I think it was good, um, and the the problems were um, for other reasons. So that's my the first part of my response. The second part is. I think it's really important to distinguish between a couple of different kinds of innovation. One is innovation where you're really creating a new um, financial product or a form of, um, of finance to try to meet a market need. The other type of innovation is regulatory arbitrage, where you're innovating to try to get around the, the regulatory framework. My fear is that Dodd-Frank is not going to hurt that second kind of innovation at all, that if anything, Dodd-Frank is going to create greater incentives for clever ways to get around regulation and lower incentives for, um, for the first kind of regulation, genuine financial um, innovation. And so I, I think we could get a if not the worst world, a worser world, where, where you're getting regulatory arbitrage, but you're not getting um, market-demanded financial innovation. So I guess that would be my response. But, but I, I mean, I think one does have to concede, or I'm willing to concede, some of the innovation in the last couple of decades is a little hard to defend. But things like credit default swaps, which, which Todd has written about, I mean, I, um, in form, I think they were a great innovation. I mean, they were abused in some respects, but I think I think they were good innovations. And that'll be our last. Well, go ahead. Oh, I just, I just wanted to say one thing about Bernanke because I think it's important to tie this back to Dodd Frank too. What Bernanke, I think, and I'm no expert on this, is grappling with is the same thing that Walter Badgett was grappling with in Lombard Street that we've been grappling with for a long time. That desperate times call for desperate measures, but at the same, and so a financial crisis might require sort of extraordinary government intervention in terms of liquidity. But at some point, the short term becomes the long term. At some point, you have to figure out how to deal with the crisis, but not allow it to become sort of baked into the system, creating perverse long-term consequences. That's one of the big problems, I think, stepping away from Bernanke specifically with, with Dodd-Frank, is that whatever you think of, of say, the, the, the problems in 2008, um, at the very least, those were desperate times. And if they called for desperate measures, that's one thing. But it's quite another thing to then build an entire financial system that takes the exceptional circumstance and makes it the default rule. And I think that's one of the big problems with liquidation authority and the FSOC, is it took what could have been sort of put behind glass to be broken in case of emergencies and made it our new sort of underlying default system. I think that's very dangerous. <laughs>
Thank you all for coming, and thank you uh, to our good panelists.